a lot of people discuss to me about like the success and all this stuff about waking up early and there's two types of people i feel like there's people that can get up and be an early riser and that's not me i'm a night owl so i quickly learned that i am a night owl so i best focus when everyone's asleep and there's no distractions around and i can be going till like 4 30 in the morning without realizing and i might wake up at eight or nine the next day but that video will be done before I fall asleep. And for me these days, that works so well living in that YouTube world where I can fall asleep and the video can be uploading instead of waiting three hours to make sure everything's sweet. When I wake up, it's ready to go. We have Alec Baker with us who is a content creator he's traveled the entire world he lives the best life out of anyone ever <laughs> yeah. uh, according to social media and uh, and us um welcome alec how are you bro thank you. i'm very well thank you how are you uh good. good good very good very excited because we have a lot in common we've never actually properly met but we've um we've been associated with similar people um so i'm super keen to dive all things content creativity, business. I mean, we're both young um, and you've made something quite brilliant out of, out of your craft. Um, so tell us, you're back in Australia. You've just spent a whole bunch of time in the US and also around the world working with Steve Cook, who a lot of people are going to know as probably one of the biggest people in fitness right now. Um, and also he seems like an absolute legend. I'm sure you can speak more about him um, throughout the podcast. What's, what did 2019 bring for you? It's huge, huge year. And uh, thank you for that little intro there. That was a bit too kind, I think. Um, but no, 2019 was a huge year for growth for me. Um, I kind of took on that role last year, um, quite late on in the year. But then this whole year was just that where I was focusing working with Steve and building his brand with him and living with him full time was such a change for me, like moving out of home, moving to a complete different country for the first time and just taking on that challenge and went full, full steam ahead with, with it was just like unreal to like learn, to move out of my comfort zone from things like looking after yourself, paying, not paying rent and things like that to like just focusing on what you want to do in life because mm. um, you don't really have the support of like living at home anymore and things like that. And then you're in a different country, like yeah. everything's different. So mm. it was crazy. Man, I love like it's as Cooney said, getting to work with someone like that and have that potential or that opportunity to grow is so, so special. But let's, let's strip it back a little bit. That um, obviously is more recent in your life, but let's take it back. Schooling, you're Central Coast boy. Um, let's give these guys that are listening a little bit of a context as to who you are. So, yeah, school life, what you did post-school, um, yeah. And so, pretty much growing up, I have three brothers. I'm the second in the family and we moved around a bunch of different schools due to family issues and money issues. So, we started the grammar school young. Um, we went there. I went till year four, changed to a public school. Um, then in that public school, we went there for two years, five and six then moved to King Cumber High for a term, two terms actually, and then moved to Eddie's. Um, after that two terms, moved to Eddie's, stayed at Eddie's all the way through. And that was pretty much my schooling. And schooling was for me like, I, f I finally realized and learned along the way, like mainly in the last two to three years, that I learned better visually and hands-on than theory-based, like a lot yeah, of people in school. So. School was kind of tough and challenging for me, especially like moving and stuff. Um, so I had to like learn to almost learn a different way to other people and accept that I wasn't going to be the smartest in the room and not try to be um, in certain subjects and stuff like that. And then growing up with like three brothers was just mayhem. Um, and I, the house I know these was always guys yeah. firsthand as well. Um, shout out to the boys, of course. <laughs> So tell us about tell us about your brothers. Yeah, so um, growing up, I, my older brothers, well, one of my older brother and the one below me, very big into the rugby and sports. Um, me and my younger bro brother, a bit more into like surfing and a bit of art and things like that. So we were the more creative one, and those two are a bit more 
uh, the heavy hitters, if you say. Um, so growing up, the house has always had something going on. If my parents were going out for dinner, there was footy on the TV and we were playing footy in the house. Things like that were always happening. Um, there were always, every weekend was jam packed with sporting events and things like that. Or there was people over at our house or we were at everyone else's house and things like that. So there was always things happening growing up. Um, there wasn't a lot of time to focus on yourself almost because there was always something going on to distract you. So growing up was like a lot of fun. Um, always a bunch of fights and stuff like that, but nothing too serious. Yeah. At the end yeah. Of the day. yeah. Nice. Nice. How did you go socially through school? I mean, so, moving, moving so many schools. Yeah. Moving was tough. Um, I had a really good, strong friend group um, when I first started school. Obviously, from kindergarten to year four, you learn and become pretty close friends with people. And then moving was kind of tough being an outsider um, at a small school that only had 160 people in from year, from kindergarten to year six was uh, quite small. So, some of the years we're joined together, like three and four would be Liam's year. The, the, my brother below me only had six boys and that was year three and year four that year right um, when we first moved that so were you so, guys ever because you're a couple of years older than him yeah were you guys ever in the same class not me um but a lot of his friends to date were in the year below him but were in his class for most of his schooling in primary school um but yeah it's it was kind of strange but then obviously when you build a friend group at a small school like that everyone knows who you are so um i love that and that was only a short time because it was two years and then after starting late in year seven, um, due to my appendix being pulled out on the first day and then going changing the next term to Eddie's, it was almost like everyone in year seven had already built their friend group and then I was coming in late again. Yeah, wow. um, so I was always on the back pedal to kind of find my way into a friend group. Um, and that was a bit of a struggle for me, especially in my younger years. Um, wasn't too confident, pretty shy person and... Um, didn't really have much drive behind me. So it was kind of tough in those eight to nine uh, year period in, in school, but it wasn't until about 10 or 11 where I kind of just stepped out of my comfort zone and started hanging out with people that I thought were similar interests and stuff. So Yeah, cool. And was it around that time frame, sort of year 11, year 12, that you were coming into content creation? You were starting to dabble with it a little bit? Or more Almost post like... I was in, I've always been creative. So, um, I've been drawing since I was about three or four. And the thing that I really noticed in myself is I've always been drawn to things like movies, like a lot of people watch movies, but, um, you know, in a different way, I kind of watch movies and trying to figure out how I even do it to date. And that's why I feel like it works so well for me right now is, um, when I watch a movie, I, I try and break it down as much as possible. I might watch it four times, um, just because I'm obsessed with it. Uh, in terms of, how they lit it, how they shot it, how they yeah. more more of an analytical mindset. At, at the start, as a young age, I didn't really care so much about that. <clears throat> it was more about why is this character doing that? Um, right. Who is this character? Where? What's his childhood like? Why? Why can I relate to him? Those personalities as well. Yeah. So I one of my favorite movies growing up was Tarzan, and me going outside and just going on hikes, and then obviously to now taking photos and loving being outdoors. Back then, it was like, how can I be more like Tarzan? How can I relate to these stories? Um, and just fell in love with that creative side of things. <clears throat> and naturally, I think as us as humans just love to communicate and it's like interact with each other is like the h highest form of what we want to do. So finding a way to uh, communicate for me was visual. Um, I'm not so good socially. I'm not so good at writing. So creating visuals for me became the key aspect for me to communicate with other people. So right. drawing and doing art um, growing up from kindergarten all the way through high school, I studied it for my HSC was huge for me. Um, content didn't really come until after school um, when I got a GoPro for Christmas and dabbled around with that for fun and then um, took it on travels and things. But um, yeah. So what did you how did your art progress what what was it like when you were a kid and then what what was like your, your hsc project so mainly as a kid i was kind of just trying to recreate a lot of things that i loved um so if it was like a cartoon character whether it was the simpsons um anything from like young child kid shows trying to redraw those um towards art became more about storytelling so uh, for my final HSC piece, it was more 
about capturing certain images that persuade people to think a different way um, and trying to create a story complete into it as if I was trying to communicate something, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. Was yeah. it more, more towards the abstract side? Yeah, yeah, most definitely. Um, just getting people to look at things differently. So a few of my images, when I displayed them, because you obviously get to display them the way you like, um, some were upside down and people didn't know, things like that. I just wanted people to have a different perspective on things and when they're looking at it. It might have been something so simple like one of the photographs I took was a padlock um, on a fence at the beach that was padlocked on the fence. And I took that photo ages ago and I remember I had it. And then I went back in my HSC after looking at that photo and took it again at the same spot. But this time it had padlocks everywhere around it. Um, and it was almost like that bridge and somewhere in Europe where people padlock a secret or whatever it is. It was similar to that. So um, I had those on either side, but if you looked at them together, it told a story, but because they were separated, you had to really think about it. And wow. if you were looking at all 10 pieces at once, you wouldn't really connect the dots. But if you looked at them individually and then chose those two together, you would see they were told a story. Mm -hmm. Things like that was kind of like moving into a different way of telling art and communicating. Yeah. How, how did that go in the HSC? How did that mark? Um, it did pretty well. Like art was my strongest subject. Woodwork was next. Um, yeah, so my hands-on subjects were my greatest. Um, my worst was probably English. I did pretty well at maths. Um, business, not too bad, but those were the subjects I studied. And then religion, um, I wasn't too great at either. Mainly for me, the hardest thing is reading and writing and communicating through that form. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's funny that no, no, like now though, before you said like socially you don't think you're that great, but you speak really well. You speak sure. and you're saying English isn't your strong point, but you can tell like even there now and I'm watching you, you're thinking about what you're saying and like it's very, mm. you articulate very well. Yeah. yeah. Also sharing your story too. It's, it's, it's actually, it comes naturally mm. for you and when you're in your element and, and that's probably where it's projected through to working with it Steve works, and yeah. stuff. It's just like it would work so well because you're just allowed to be creative. Oh, but the reason I asked you about how you marked, I was talking art in, in yeah. particular, because I wanted to, because because I didn't do very well in school, <clears throat> like like you, English was shit, shit a subject of yeah. mine. Um, I was more of a visual person, um, but I, I'd be interested to see how the markers from from a education, um, <clears throat> uh, coming from an education point of. Uh, marking it in a certain way versus your interpretation because obviously art is very uh, subjective 100%. and um, obviously it depends on who was marking it or whatever but mm -hmm. yeah that's what I was interested about because obviously you put a lot of effort in mm -hmm. you, you really gave it your all and, and, and you're uh, hoping they see it the same way that you yeah or interpret it differently but still appreciate it in the same way for the effort that you put in yeah, definitely I, I think the I got really lucky in that stage because we had a teacher move across from Joey's um, in my last year and a half. Um, she was a lovely teacher. I've forgotten her name. Um, but Mrs. she Mrs. she gave me a great um, point of view when I was discussing before we started doing our HSA part um, to think really about that question because she was bringing up the topic. Uh, you can see this in an art form and you can see what it's worth. Um, is everyone going to be able to see that? Now, they don't have to, but are you going to be able to give that story across without mm -hmm. saying it in clear lines, without writing it in big words? Are you going to be able to obviously get across that message that you're trying to give? And that was one of the parts because I wanted to do what I was best at and draw. And my ideas of drawing would have been almost probably, I think, worse for me mark-wise because... I wasn't so well in my drawing skills of translating what I wanted because it was so abstract in the way I drew that they could misinterpret everything and Absolutely. it could be hard to mark. So it was more of a strategic um, art piece than mm -hmm. probably what I really wanted to do. Okay. And that was probably the same with my woodwork as well. Um, I made a bookcase um, with like a sliding ladder and shelves and stuff like that. And it was more of like, Woodwork was more marked off, show off your skills, how well you can perform and put it together and how less you can mess up, I guess. So right. making something simple, making it a little bit more complex, but being very neat and tidy with all my work right. was how I would score better than trying to make 
like my brother, a pool table that might not yeah. function so well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's yeah, interesting that's because it's creating limitations for, for, for you and for yeah. other students. And, and um, it's a good lesson. I think anyone listening, um, go for gold because um, you're here now. Yeah. You've done what you've done. Um, even having the marks, I mean, obviously the way that you went um, didn't necessarily require the HSC, mm-hmm. but I think that's a good um, that's a good indication that for anyone who really has that inkling and wants to follow their intuition or their heart or their what they see and they want to do it, whether it's in your HSC or whether it's in any given situation, do whatever you feel like, do whatever you want. Um, and moving forward a couple of years now, you've been able to do that and, and that's shined through. And also you have the lesson knowing that that's what's happened. It's been able to project mm. you forward. What, um, take us after school, you picked up the GoPro, you took it on holidays. Yes. What did you enjoy so much about that? Um, Again, just being a creative, of course. I think it was just reliving those moments and, um, experiences like, there's nothing like uh, traveling and experiencing new things with new friends and seeing and even looking back on it is so was to me was so rewarding and just seeing how much fun we're having when we were there just wanted me to travel again like Mm -hmm. just motivated me to go again and try and capture some more and even though a lot of people see it as a bad thing to take a lot of photos and say live in the moment things like that for me it's almost like it's motivating me to go travel because I want to capture new things and I want to see new things. And although I do see things, I might as well capture them while I'm there. Like some people have said to me, like, will you ever go to a place and not take a photo? And yes, I will. And there's a lot of places where I don't bring my camera out, but there's a lot of places where I will bring my camera out, but I might spend more time there just to experience the moment, live in the moment and still capture it. Like it's not as black and white as whatever it makes it out to be. Yeah. Um, for me, it was just like, once I had a fun, put it together, I didn't really know what I was doing. Like I had the GoPro on settings so that I could connect it to my phone, which is the most basic settings you could do. I didn't know that at the time, but right. it was literally so I could pretty much airdrop from my GoPro to my phone so I could play around with the clips and yeah. photos. Nice. And it was just um, something I really enjoyed and found fun. So I just kept going with it. And then working full time, I saved up quite a lot of my money and then put down on a point and shoot and that was the start of it for me. Nice. What was what was your first job out of school? Um, first job, so I literally, as I left school, everyone knew that I was very outdoorsy and like I've been in love with gardens ever since. Um, I was a young boy and linking back to that Tarzan story and mm-hmm. had so many tree houses and things like that and was always outdoors. So um, I got offered two jobs to to um, landscape and I wanted to get into landscape design when I was leaving school and was trying to think of what would be a good role for me because I knew that I could draw still, um, I could still have creative control and design and things like that and then Mm -hmm. landscaping I was very passionate about already. So um, that was one of the things I try to link up together and I started in landscaping because I try to take on an internship with a famous designer um, and he kind of explained the role of how he got to where he was. He didn't go down the uni course or anything like that he went through landscaping built up and learnt what the ins and outs are on the physical side of the job and then went into design and studied that so i kind of wanted to follow in his footsteps and do that um just so i could follow his role because i really respected his work and Mm. it was where i wanted to be if i was going to take that career path um so pretty much a month after finishing school i stepped into an apprenticeship there nice and um took that on yeah how long did that last so i did three years um completed my course and it's pretty funny but i the day i completed my course at tafe and everything was the same day i quit my job (laughs) oh dude i remember you Um, telling me that (laughs) it was it was a little bit crazy and um was this because things were like you were starting to work with different brands with your uh, content work yeah so how it all came about was um i was still like i Without realizing, I just loved being creative. So landscaping for me, I could go to a garden, shape it, create it, because we were doing maintenance work, not so much um, construction where you have to lift heavy stone and stuff. I could go and hedge things and shape them into balls and flower and prune, all this stuff that I could be creative with my hands on, which I did enjoy. Um, And then moving down the track, still in my off time, I was DJing and doing art. So I was constantly being creative, but 
the problem I, I found was I was putting my creative control into so many different things. I wasn't focusing on one. Um, so everything was almost half-hearted in a way. And then um, me and my brothers went on a trip in my second year of my apprenticeship halfway through um, to Europe. And I kind of, that just kind of opened up a new world for me. Traveling before, I was always young. So it was always where your family went and things like that. And you kind of normally spent the time by the pool in the resort. So you didn't really travel, I guess. Um, but once doing that family trip um, with my brothers in Europe kind of opened up my eyes to the world and, and wanted me to, gave me the inspiration to want to see more things and visit more places and new, meet new people. So um, that kind of sparked the energy of what content created could have brought on later on. So that Christmas in my second year is when I got the GoPro, which was about 2017. Right. Um, and that was just before my third year. And then I went on a trip to New Zealand with my mates, took the GoPro along and kind of captured it all. And after that, it was just like each weekend, try and do a trip anyway, even if it was up the coast or yeah, nice. anything. And that kind of sparked my content um, to try and make a thing out of it. So originally the story, um, in my third year, I started a website. I don't know if you remember, it was called The Weekends. And it was literally, it, it kind of gave me a reason to do something every weekend. Yeah. So every Saturday, I would capture a story about some place. Nice. And then every Sunday was a story about someone. Um, so I called it The Weekends. It was a crazy little idea, a little project I made for myself. And um, it kind of forced me to create content. And as you know, like, creating content, you kind of want to have some backed up and planned and things like that. So a lot of thought goes into it. So having one that every Saturday I had to go somewhere and tell a story of it and then publish it as a blog with photos and stuff like that, interview people and stuff. And then Sunday would be a person made me go places, visit places, capture it um, and go meet people. So, And this is while you're still working full time? This is all still while I'm working full time. Um, every weekend like i wasn't a person that even when i did dj and do that i didn't even drink so i did have a lot of time on my hands and i wasn't much of a party person to go out and pre all day and then party so i did find any time of the day to do what i wanted to do creatively so that was all my focus at the time that's epic it served you well yeah, it, you ex- well. it has. And that's that's full on. So it's Monday to Friday landscape. So Monday to Friday, um, 4.30 leave on a Monday. Um, and then normally 5.30 finish on a Friday afternoon. Yeah, I was right. lucky enough to um, have my auntie's place in Sydney where I could crash during the week. Cool. Um, the rest of the crew is from the coast, from Kilcare. So they would have to travel back. Yeah. Um, but that allowed me to finish work around 4, 4.30, mm-hmm. um, be in the city and run off somewhere to shoot something and capture something. Um, It didn't matter if there was a subject or not, if I was um, just going to a park or I was going skating down to the city and just capturing the buildings or I was DMing someone on Instagram and actually capturing them. Um, So that was a lot of things that I was doing with my free time and it was just kind of became, after a long time, kind of came pretty lonely because I was so focused on just creating so much that I wasn't communicating with people that I was close with. Um, So I kind of went down a path where I kind of forgot about, I don't know, catching up with friends and things like that. That's what it felt like um, to just focusing on, I'm just going to create something every weekend and with all my free time. It's, it's, it can, it can take hold. And and it's uh, like you were saying before, it's like people ask you, um, don't, is there times where you just don't take the camera or feel like you're not being in the moment and, Mm -hmm. um, I've experienced all that as well and it's trying to find that balance socially as well and and again being in the moment so uh in parts as well but also as a creator you just want to shoot it like there's there's just that it's just what you know and it's just and and i've i've i got to a point in my career where i found that i was so heavily focused on looking through the lens um that i couldn't really recall particular experiences as grand as they were and you're 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 out shooting some of the greatest things and it's kind of like yeah but it wasn't that great because i was kind of shooting it so Mm. i can understand both sides of the thing but also you just want to shoot it you just want to shoot it what do you remember your first client and how that came about first client I think actually was for Proud Mary's back at Woodport. Um, Because I was DJing, um, I would bring my camera along and try and capture 
uh, me and my mate Kay, DJ. Um, and then, yeah, some people on the D4 and just try and get this DJing scene going for us. And I thought that was a great way to do it. I would capture the headliner before us or after us and piece it together and hope they would repost it. And then um, they kind of just asked me to start filming every weekend. And um, it paid pretty good for me. Like someone that just started content creation to get paid when you were just doing it for fun, just... Mm. It's just like so exciting. So, yeah, you, you, a hundred percent. Yeah, and, and like still going out and partying, and like not even partying, but like still going out and socializing with friends, but getting paid. Was just like I felt like I was the king of the world at the time. I was dream, like, man. I'm living it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a proud marriage, and I'm getting paid. Yeah. Like, yeah. how bad can yeah, you get? <laughs> exactly. Piss, piss off their head. Exactly. Um, that's awesome, man. So where? Where did it kind of go from there? Because because now obviously being involved where you are, yeah. um, what drew you to the fitness industry? So I think the biggest thing that worked for me um, just creating was that I didn't stop creating just because people started paying me. So I, I kept doing things for fun and stuff. And there was a project that me and my friends put together and we went down to Himes Beach um, down the south coast and saw a little video, um, just a bunch of us hanging out, doing some fun stuff, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, it got seen by a guy that works with uh, Life Without Andy okay. and um, they're a media company based out of Sydney and they run a lot of cool events and photograph a lot of cool people. So, uh, on an afternoon when I was working in Sydney, just running around, I got a message from them and they asked if I wanted to shoot their video content as they are three photographers um, and they kind of wanted to outsource their video work so they didn't have to do photos and video at the same time, sure. um, which is understandable. Yeah. Um, so I kind of took on that role and that really worked for me a lot because it put me into different groups and categories um, throughout Sydney in that area where I wasn't just trying to lead jobs from other jobs. It was almost like they had every client they wanted and people were coming to them. So that work was coming to me instead of me running around like a headless chook trying to find work. Yeah. Um, so that I could take on that full time role mm. of being able to quit my job and do that. So that was a big takeoff for me. And then that just led to give me opportunity to capture things that were unique and different and actually looked really nice and had a budget and stuff like that. So I could actually put a lot of work into work so that people could actually see what I was capable of. Yeah. Because as you know, before that, when it's just you trying to rock around with a low budget, it's like you're trying to do the best you can, but half the time it's it's all you putting in pretty much all the effort to get mm. paid cents or... Of course. Hey. And when you, when you break that down, like mm. that's why I got out of the wedding industry because you're yeah. dealing with some clients and by the time you're doing your emails, mm. your chase-ups, um, the re-edits, yeah, the exactly. sorting through the footage... Um, the mayhem of the day, of course. Like mm. I was calculating, and I'm like, you think you're getting a good payday, but but some clients you work with, you, you're drawing 15 bucks an hour. Exactly. And for a creator who's running a business, who has overheads, who doesn't get consistent work, mm. like we can sit here, people can people can say that, oh, you're complaining because you're getting paid to do what you love. It's like, no, we're trying to run a business, yeah. and um, it is great. But yeah, that's why I got out of it. Yeah, it can be very stressful, um, especially freelancing. Like there's. A lot of times where you go months of just work after work after work to dead months where you have nothing at all and i stay in contact with a lot of my friends around the world that are freelancers still and they still face those troubles every month or so so it's real and it it is what it is but um yeah i got pretty lucky with those guys because they have work constantly and um they still do and they're such they've got such a good name for themselves that they i, I don't know when they will go without work but um yeah, that kind of really helped me dive into that space where I could really focus on just performing my skills and myself really well, where everything else would have something involved. So you'd always have a makeup artist, you'd have a creative director, you'd have a light guy, you would have a photographer yeah. as compared to these budget scenes where someone would come with this brilliant idea with you in their head and somehow you've got to make it come alive with $200, $300 yeah. um, without, for me, I had a point and shoot, I had two lenses I didn't have any lighting, didn't have any mic. Yep. I was running with budget, budget, budget set up. So mm. it was kind of challenging. And then when I got into that space, it kind of allowed me to show off what I was capable of. And then from there, it was just like clients came to me and it wasn't me just asking people if they needed things shot or yeah. getting word of mouth around. It was more people know who I am now. It's 
yeah. if you want to work with me, contact me. Would it have been around this time that you headed up to Active Escapes, Queensland? Yeah, so uh, from so memory- that, that was a big, I mean, that was probably a game changer for you. That was obviously where you met Steve up there. Uh, yeah, so when I met Steve, it was actually on my fourth, fourth Active Escape trip. So my first one, I was still landscaping and it was coming to the end of that point where I wasn't sure if I could actually make that step to full-time or not. Yeah, um, full-time creative. Yeah, so this was about six months of starting to try and be a creator from mm-hmm. buying my camera back in May. Yeah. Um, also, when you're referring to point and shoot, are you referring to a camera? I, I'm referring to a camera, yes. Yeah, yeah, so. right. wow. yeah, well, I'm out here, wow. right? I'm out here. This What's a pec non- deck? Oh, What's a yeah. pec deck? We've all got our <laughs> pec deck. <laughs> I, when I mean that, but it's just a basic camera setup, so pretty much at the lowest budget you can afford and anyone can really buy one these days. Um, but to my extent, they're not really an excuse to be bad at anything. Um, the camera is a tool. Um, you need to use that tool to your capabilities to make the best product. And that's being proved through oh. iPhones in particular. Like something got, there was an ad, a recent, it, it was a, it was like a Mark, Mark Jacobs ad or so a really high fashion brand all completely shot on an iPhone, yeah. massive campaign. And that's what I always tell people. Mm. It's like, and you have three lenses in a fucking little yeah. tablet shit. It, so it, what are you complaining about? Uh, my content, content is fantastic. Par, not par. subpar, just par. Just par. Par's good. Par yeah, even to the extent of uh, Michael Bay shot a complete film on an iPhone recently. Yeah. Um, that's soon to come out, so. Wait, full movie. Yeah, so he's the guy that made Transformers and all those crazy action films with a lot of explosions and yeah. he's very teal and orange uh, color grade. Um, but yeah, for that, it was more the sense um, that that was a big step for me because I was discussing with my parents um, moving into the, the creative role if it was a smart idea or not. My dad is a builder and my mum is a real estate agent. So for me, as a landscaper, one of my biggest goals was to buy a property, um, invest, have an investment property, build it up with my dad, renovate it, landscape it, and then eventually get my mum to sell it. And it was this, this idea that I created in my head that if I did achieve that, that was success for me. Mm. Um, so for me, when I was landscaping, from getting paid $10 an hour, I was trying to save 92% of my wage where I wouldn't spend money on anything. Um, even it came down to, exactly. So until I got to that point where creation, like content creating was everything to me, that money wasn't a thought anymore, that if it cost me a lot to buy a thousand dollar camera or a thousand dollar lens, I was gonna do it because it's what I wanted to do instead of buying this investment property and stuff like that. So that was game changing for me. and. That kind of woke me up when I did that active escapes trip because most of my jobs were based in Sydney and and normally I would have to travel two hours, but getting paid to spend a week, hang out with a lot of bunch of people and the job was super relaxed for me. Like I was known in Sydney for creating work that I could turn over that night. So going to an event, shooting at 8.30 till 9.30 and the client would have it before they wake up, um, full production and everything. So that's how I developed my name and it was what a life of that Andy kind of had a reputation for it was right. they would go to an event and when you woke up in the morning the pictures would be live so that people could share those photos and yeah. you see people when they go to those events they want to post those photos because they have such good photographers and the image mm-hmm. is always cool and that why build a hype around something that might be done on a Saturday and you're posting on a Thursday. Yeah. It doesn't have the same feel. Absolutely. And this day with social media, it's the key to keep that up to date. That yeah. people want to see what you're doing right here, right now. It's like why live and thing and stories are huge. Yeah. And like YouTube and stuff is massive because you can see into someone's full life and like a whole day with them if you wanted to. Yeah. Things like that. So uh, getting paid to live like a week in Noosa with Active Escapes was my first one, which is crazy. Just hanging out with some real cool, unique people, like like-minded that all paid to be there. And I was getting paid to do the same things as them, yeah. Yeah. whether it was surfing in Noosa, like one of my fav- favorite places to surf, or it was uh, weightboarding, something I'd never done before and things yeah. like that. I was just like, this is the life, like yeah. getting paid to do this. All these people are paying to be here, like yeah. thousands of dollars. Mm-hmm. 
and they're paying for me to run around with a GoPro on my head. Yeah. Like, and pretty cool. Like crazy, that. crazy. Absolutely. How did your parents um, go with with wanting to make that change? So, uh, I am very, very lucky to have grown up with like. I believe some of the best parents in the world. Um, my my parents are very very supportive, and I do remember being very nervous to have the kind of conversation. And I kind of like almost dabbled at it here and there a lot, and just asked a few questions of like what they thought, but never really had the conversation properly. And then I remember like two weeks before I quit my landscaping job that I literally asked my parents something I'd never done before, like, "Can you sit down with me and have a chat?" And they were like what is he going to talk about? Like, yeah. you know, that feeling yeah, like, like, yeah, you yeah, know what I mean? Like, like oh, they were yeah. like, what are you talking about? Okay. Yeah. This is weird. Oh, I could imagine it. Yeah, Your mum yeah. would have been stressing. Oh yeah. hundred percent. And then as soon as I started discussing it, they were fine. But, um, yeah, they, my parents pretty much said to me like, look, this is something that we can see that you want to do. It's all you're trying to do right now. Um, take a year or two and we'll support you and just have a crack at it. And that's literally what they said. They just said, Go have a crack at it. Like you've, you're gonna. My dad said, just wait until you finish your course, and then you have that, and you're qualified. Because mm. I, I didn't want to. I kind of wanted to quit right there and then. Because I was like, look, I'm earning enough money on a Saturday. I can quit right now and earn more money than I do a week. Yeah. And he's like, look, I understand that, but that would just be a whole waste of the last three years. And he's like, I, I know, I know. So I finished my course, and then, yeah, they were like, do what, whatever makes your heart grow. So. So the day you finish your course, that's when you quit, hey? Yeah. Oh. You my certificate, I'm, I'm out of here. Be like, <laughs> awesome, man, like you're done now. And you're just like, yeah, I'm, I'm mad. Yeah. <laughs> nah, he, he kind of knew it was coming. He kind of saw um, that like all my, as I was explaining before, like I had all my creative ideas going in different places with art, DJing and landscaping and think even in any other thing. Mm. Um, that he saw that all my passion just went into one. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like when people have interest in a lot of different things like cars and then PlayStation games and all these different things and they're not too great at one and then as soon as they put their heart and soul into one, yeah. they, they're just beyond it. So that he saw that pretty coming and um, I kind of had the conversation with him before my parents actually because we were like mates almost. So he was like, yeah, I, I can kind of understand it. He, he grew up and he went to art school, he left school when he was 17 so he he totally understood and yeah. yeah he had that kind of same thing with a couple of people before me that worked for him and he knew it was a kind of stepping stone for me because he knew that i had so much creativity and that my heart was there but like i really wasn't there mm. if that made sense like yeah. that's cool that he was you know he's putting your interests first there yeah most definitely and I, the, the, the biggest thing i saw in him is as well that he is a person that wants to build cars and stuff like that. And that was his kind of hobby that like mine is content creation these days. Um, but he had the expectations to support his family and stuff. So he can't just run off and do that as compared to me that was living at home and had the support of my parents and had money saved that I could jump ship um, because I had a parachute. Um, he didn't. So he totally understood that. Yeah, that's awesome, man. And, and props to you for taking that leap. Yeah. Um, it led and to very good things. Very yeah. happy life. There, it did, life. yeah. So take us, take us for four active escapes in. Where Was that the festival? Um, no, I, I didn't actually get to go to the festival. I was actually with Steve um, for the festival. Steve was actually supposed to be on the festival. Funny story. Um, but yeah, he got caught up with work overseas and stuff and we had Gymshark okay. stuff to attend. Right. Um, but no, the next one after that was... Um, the Maldives, I went on the Super Yacht, yeah, that was the first time they did that. They normally did it on Ceneva, the island um, at the resort. And then I literally hadn't done active scapes for probably four or five months um, as I was just doing stuff in Sydney and stuff. And then the owner, Zana, called me up and said, hey, look, I want you to come for the next two weeks. I've got Optimum sponsoring one week. Um, they're going to pay really well for you as well to do stuff on the side after the week. And then... Um, We've got Steve Cook on the next week and I didn't know who Steve Cook was at the time. So, um, I was like, okay, this yeah. sounds all right. And then he was, he was tossing it up to me and just like, look, this is serious. Like if you want to be in the content creation world and you want to get your name out there, I think this is the best way for you. Like, blah, blah, blah. We'll sort you out. We'll get you up here, blah, blah, blah. So, I kind of took it on faith of him because I was getting to a point in my career where 
Active Escapes was more of like a holiday for me for a fun project um, where it was a lot more chilled out as compared to Sleepless Nights and stuff. It was more that I got to hang out with people for fun and yeah. got to shoot their photo here and there um, and capture some videos. So I kind of went up on a leap of faith. And then after that full week, Steve was on the second week. Um, he literally asked me, um, his videographer went back like the day before him and he said, oh, do you want to shoot a vlog for me? Um, my videographer had to go back the day before, blah, blah, blah. That was just the way they booked their flights. And I said, yeah, sure thing. Um, didn't think much of it. And he seemed like a really nice guy through the week. It's lovely to everyone. And um, so that afternoon we went went surfing, had some food, did some meetings and kind of shot a vlog out of nothing. And then um, that evening he came out because he was trying to plan himself so that he could fly back and not be jet lagged. And he was still awake at 12 and I was still awake at 12 and he was on the lounge watching a movie and then the movie finished and I literally had the vlog finished for him and oh. he watched it there and then. Before man, that instantaneous yeah. getting it back to them. And I think the biggest key for that um, that I didn't even realize was that the, the videographer that he had at the time, they were putting out one to two, uh, one video to two a fortnight. So it's like one a week or even one every two weeks as compared to I gave it to him that day that we finished filming um, was pretty crazy for him because he was just like blown away with all the content that I'd already done that week for Active Escapes that they received before everyone left. Like I would put it on the big screen, play the video, show everyone the photos before they left, which was unheard of on Active Escapes. It must be so productive when you need to be on. Can you just hone in just like that? It's crazy you say that because like um, for me, it's like, the next thing I want to do once I've shot something, I want to I want to see it come to life. Like, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm not shooting just to say that I shoot. Like, I'm capturing videos so that I can get back in that room and piece it together and show you what I'm made of. Exactly. Like creation, right? Exactly. Yeah, like, yeah. That's where I I feel like I really dive in, and a lot of people discuss to me about like the success and all this stuff about waking up early and there's two types of people I feel like there's people that can get up and be an early riser, and that's not me. I'm a night owl, so I quickly learned that I am a night owl. So I best focus when everyone's asleep and there's no distractions around and I can be going till like 4.30 in the morning without realizing. And I might wake up at 8 or 9 the next day, but that video will be done before I fall asleep. And for me these days, that works so well living in that YouTube world where I can fall asleep and the video can be uploading instead of waiting three hours to make sure everything's sweet. When I wake up, it's ready to go. It's almost like that for me now, but that's how it's worked in my favor to date. But yeah, that, that for me was almost my signature was to be quick turnaround and yeah. absolutely but quality as well. Like the stuff yeah. you put out is insane, man. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like you must be able to just, um, and you obviously put in the hours. That's the, a massive thing, but being able to just switch on when you need to and just go. Mm. So what, what obviously impressed the crap out of him? Um, blown away by and then moving shifting into that YouTube world mm. your skills benefited um, or complemented I should say what what he wanted to do what uh, what happened from there where did the relationship go um, so yeah he kind of asked me on the spot just before he flew out the next day was hey do you want to move to America and film YouTube with me <laughs> and so when, yeah. when someone <laughs> asks you that you kind of don't take them seriously you kind of say yeah yeah that would be cool like and didn't think sure much of it. Where you weren't 100% sure of like, yeah. you know him that well. Oh, I met this guy like six days ago. <laughs> wow. Like, yeah, he's big human, but like, yeah. I didn't know how big of a human he was. Yeah. yeah sure. um, yeah. But um, it, it's kind of a crazy offer. Like someone that still lives at home, just started this career about six, seven months ago. Um, someone to ask you to live on the other side of the world with him is kind of intimidating so I didn't really take it seriously and then kind of had my whatsapp as ready already because of active escapes and stuff and then just kept messaging me like yeah yeah you ready to go and stuff and I'm like geez like I didn't think you're serious like everything you know all those hours and those days months years that you put into trying to trying to break through in that yeah. industry and then an offer oh, like yeah it, for me it was crazy because I kind of felt like there's, there's a point in people's career where they feel like that, like I haven't had a very long career in this, but you kind of imagine like the top stage as being like, 
I don't know, Hollywood star, blah, blah, blah. And then there's the realistic stage. And I thought I was already at that, just working in Sydney with Life That Andy and stuff. And I was like, I'm already living the dream, like, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Like, when that offer came around, it was just like, that's the next step. Like, what else is there? Where else is, what else are you going to do if you don't take this? And it's kind of crazy because I still had a job lined up. My next job after Active Escapes, so I had to fly back to Sydney like the day after. Um, and I had to travel to Chile for three weeks. And I was documenting an ultra marathon there for Under Armour with uh, Ben Seymour. Yeah, um, yeah Andrew Paps. So, during that time, Steve was literally without a vi videographer just waiting for me to move. And I didn't realize that because I was in Chile documenting all this and he was messaging me every now and again like, I've got your flights booked, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, He's He's got to I've got your yeah. flights booked. <laughs> Come on, guy. He's going, this bloody Aussie off, guy Steve. is not getting back to me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the, the craziest thing for me was... Um, Literally the day I came back from Chile, my mum opened her store down here the, down the road at Terrigal and um, our house got struck by lightning that same night. So, I literally got off the plane from Chile after three weeks documenting in the Atacama Desert and then went straight to our office off the plane to celebrate the opening and then that night we drove home and our house was on fire. So, oh, I, um, I had to fly out two days later as well to live with Steve after that. He get like I had two days and in that two days I had to give across that documentary to Under Armour. Um, I had to, yeah, the crazy thing was that when our house got struck by lightning, um, I lost a lot of clothes and my brothers did and my Mac was there that I used to edit a lot of stuff on because it was faster. I lost that and things like that. Um, I had my laptop still because that's what I traveled with, but it was kind of wasn't the fastest thing. So I bunkered down to Sydney and um, crashed at a mate's place for two nights on his couch. And he just had some crazy freakish computer that he let me use while he was at work. So for two days straight, I locked myself in his little bedroom and uh, just edited until I had to fly out the next day. And Because how long was that video that you put together? Uh, it was 30 minute video, which to me nowadays doesn't seem that bad. But um, back then I was only creating like one minute ads yeah. for events and companies so That's and it was it, i also had to do um seven instagram videos to build hype around each time um leading up to it so they want they had a full campaign behind it and all these people that had expectations for me to deliver this on a certain yeah. date um because they already hyped it up to be released on that so it wasn't like Hey man, my house got struck by lightning i'm going through yeah. a bit of shit i gotta move to america in two days you're trying to juggle yeah, man, like it would have been so many mixed emotions. Oh, 100%. I was just like, oh, I'm not going to get paid. This is going to be shit. Yeah. No one's going to like it. It's but crazy. You, you got it done, yeah? Yeah. Because uh, I watched that video and it was Yeah, it's powerful. crazy because Ben didn't, Ben saw it as a stepping stone to start this mission of his where he'd gone through playing super rugby on the other side of the world and then becoming a fitness trainer. And it was crazy because he got injured and screwed around with contracts that he went from such a high level as a professional athlete to just training in a gym at Sydney and being a personal trainer, which is not bad at all. But he just got to a point where he goes, I need to push myself again. Like mm -hmm. I need to break out of this comfort zone. I'm at a stagnant point where I feel like I'm not really achieving anything in life. So this was his first big quest. And from there on, he hasn't stopped. He's just, all around the world, I see him on Instagram stories just doing Listen crazy him, things. Man. Yeah. But, you, still, um, you still keep in contact with him? Yeah, yeah. Still stay in contact with him. He's a legend. He's, um, I think he just got back from the UK right now. But um, we're trying to cross paths in this year coming. He's going to be, can't announce it yet, but he's going running a big race across America. Um, him oh, and his mate. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's not a, well, I mean, this will be, this will be a couple of months from now anyway. Yeah. So that'll be cool. Um, Sweet, man. So then you obviously made the leap um, straight into like stories I've heard. It seems like that stepping stone again. It's like you've gone from landscaping 10 bucks an hour to working with these guys. And it's like you think that's just as good as it gets. Like, and then active escapes. And then now it's just like, boom, like yeah. America. It's crazy. Like everyone has their views of America before they go. And it's just like. Everyone thinks it's going to be as cool as what the movies make it out to be, but it's like anywhere you have high expectations for somewhere and you kind of, I didn't get like disappointed, but I just got shocked on how different it was from what I expected. Because mm. uh, Utah. Yeah, we moved to, I moved to Steve's place in Utah and St. George, which is a small town. And I could kind of relate to that because growing up in Kilcare is like really small. 
Yeah. Um, but I had these ideas in my head that would be in like the hustle and bustle of yeah. Hollywood and mm -hmm. all the yeah. fame and stuff. Yeah. And I'm so glad it wasn't. Yeah. But I, I see that now. But when I first landed there, I kind of got a shock because I was like, I thought I was going into like fame, like fame. Like I didn't know what was about to hit me. Yeah. But awesome. it was the best thing that hit me that it wasn't that because I don't like LA. Yeah. And after experiencing you it many times, like <laughs> see, you, you, there's, there's things about LA that you won't like. But the reason why I don't like certain parts of LA, I should say, yeah. is because of what it's hyped up to be and what everyone's trying to be there. Yeah. Um, it's not so much LA. So if you're a tourist, it's fine. Yeah. But it's yeah. somewhere where I wouldn't want to live. And yeah. I'll let you experience that for yourself and you'll, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And it's only because we are so lucky to grow up here in Australia where everything is like picturesque compared to places like that or India or other countries. Um, so, yeah, I moved to Utah and it was literally like living in Steve's pocket for a year um, where wherever he went overseas, which we pretty much left every month or two to a different country or a different state, that I was with him the whole time. And a lot of this was for Gymshark stuff? Yeah, Gymshark was, it w is pretty much his main contract for travel-wise, I guess, if you say that. Um, so, they pay him on a regular basis to go places over a year contract. He's he has to be committed to go to certain pop-up events. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's part of his contract and they send him clothes and all that stuff. But there's also other companies that want you to go other places and even if you want to pitch to another country as a uh, company as well and say, Hey, look, we're looking to come here. Do you guys want to s collaborate with us? Do you want to work with us? It kind of like gets rid of the cost of either the flights or the accommodation depends what you're doing with the company or things like that. So we kind of traveled for work um, to create more work because obviously YouTube is our game and yeah. social media is our game. So moving around makes good content for us. So yeah, right. How is this? How is this for you? I mean, you'd already been overseas a few times and done yeah. bits of travel, but it's like now it's full oh, on. And I, yeah. I absolutely love this role, and it's it's amazing because um, working with someone like Steve, he just gives me full reign on everything nice. and trusts me one hundred percent. And that was one of the biggest differences and the most enjoying things I found out of this stage of my career was because I was always making videos for clients, doing what they wanted and blah, blah, blah. Whereas this, living with the guy, he's almost he's almost like my best friend and we're just communicating on what we want to do. Nice. Like he has my thought in mind as well as his own so that when it comes to doing something, say if we're going out on the Polaris or we're going out on the boat, he's like, what do you want to make the video about? And gives me full reign instead of a client telling me we want this shot and this shot. Here's the model. Well, this is the location. We want it done like this, this, and this, and then show you references. You're pretty much recreating something that's already been made before. Nine times out of 10, they already have a video that they say pretty much recreate this with their logo on it. It's like, yeah. I'm not really creating that. I'm just copying. So, yeah. working with Steve has been like a blessing for me. And it's just helped me even to test my own things out and... um hone in on my skills mm. when you have to create a video when I first started every second day or now we're at a stage where we're just creating two a week it's really pushes you to try different things because you're creating so often with the same yeah. person that you're kind of just trying to find new ways to create so absolutely obviously this is really full on you reckon with Steve you've still got that creative rain you're still obviously having fun um but it sounds still very hectic how did you find did you find that you could get work-life balance you seem like someone who just loves to work anyway and be creative but it gets to a point i know through micro it gets to a point where you're like fuck like i wish i could just step back sometimes how did you did you manage to so find find a balance that was what this in 2019 kind of was for me um we started off when I first started working with Steve, it was back in October uh, 2018 and I did like a trial for three months with him to see how our relationship would go because living with someone obviously full time, you kind of want the relationship to work more than the content because you're living with them. I'll be sitting next to him on the flight. I'll be waiting for the flight with him. I'll be in the same cab as him. Um, things like that and I live in his house like on the other side I have to wake up in the morning he's going to be there too so you want to get along with the guy and I'm going to have to film him nine times out of ten every day so 
you want to have a good relationship with that. And we were filming every second day and it's draining for both of us because he saw the potential in me to obviously push out content so fast. And I was, it was awesome. We were just smashing out content after content after content. Like there was too much for people to view. Like yeah, right. we got to a stage where people weren't watching the last three videos because they're only going on YouTube on say a Saturday and we'd already uploaded four videos yeah. between the last Saturday. So it became a point where we were just hitting even views and on YouTube views is the game and that's what pays us. So yeah. we kind of had to quickly figure out what we thought we were doing wrong. And um, it was almost like shoving too much down people's throat. And the crazy thing was it was a blessing in disguise for both of, us, both of us because when you're traveling and you're trying to upload something every second day, catching a flight that's nine hours will put you so far behind. Yeah. Or even like a, a nine hour flight is for us two hours to Vegas, catch a, an hour flight to LA where you have to be at your flight two hours before check in your bags, land in Vegas, then fly from LA, I mean, land in LA, then fly from LA to London just to go to a Gymshark event mm -hmm. that you're probably going to be shooting the next day so you can't be editing that day. Yeah. You're behind. You yeah. have to have things well ahead. So yeah. it became super exhausting for both of us yeah. and we got to the point where we decided to do two a week and just more strategy-based where we'd actually think out what we're doing, not just turn on the camera because yesterday we posted so tomorrow we're going to post again yeah, yeah, um absolutely. which was crazy that we didn't realize how much we really drained ourselves yeah, okay. like some of the videos just they weren't bad but they just didn't have much in them they were just forced yeah, yeah. they weren't on that whole idea of quality over quantity yeah, yeah. not saying that there wasn't quality but yeah. to you viewing it back you I seem like so. yeah and and I watch some of them back. Like I just did the year of you for us um, when I've just had this time at home over Christmas just for fun, just because I had a bit of time over Christmas to play around with stuff. So, yeah, yeah. that's just me in a nutshell. But um, <laughs> yeah, so that was just looking back at some of the videos, I could see through the videos, like obviously I shot them and I, it puts me back to those places, but I could see how forced they were like, we were just walking around just doing stuff because YouTube wanted to see it. What, what we thought YouTube wanted to see. Um, it wasn't really what we wanted to capture. So 2019 was a big learning curve for us in that space of, yes, we can pump out videos really fast, but is it going to be worth it? Um, and just enjoying and embracing good moments in life. Like yeah. there's so many times now where I won't even think about turning on my camera. And as I explained at the start, it's what I want to do all the time, but, Sometimes it's better not to because get your mind fresh and find some new inspiration because we're not full of just inspiration all the time. And yeah. sometimes I would say, oh, yes, I, I love shooting. I just want to do it. But I'd go out and shoot something that was not worth my while or yeah. would say yes to something that w wasn't worth my while or my time, yeah. which is obviously a learning curve. But for me, it's spending time with family and stuff that I hadn't seen in six to eight months or even a year. So, or friends that I hadn't seen in two years that I would rather just sit and have a chat with them and yeah, stuff absolutely. like that. So, I've got a couple more questions. One um, technical question mm -hmm. How I'm not a vlogger, yeah. like, man, we've been trying to vlog for Bridge the Gap and I'm just like, I'm stepping <laughs> into a whole new world, which is the transition that you made. Yeah. And I think the biggest, the biggest thing that really overwhelms me is one data like mm -hmm. one just oh, yeah. tons and tons of data to like just knowing when to bring the camera out knowing mm -hmm. knowing when to do it knowing what to shoot and obviously we're doing it for ourselves so it's kind of hard but i really wanted to ask you how you've managed the, the technical side and also just like the constant knowing when to turn it off when to turn yeah. it on and how you manage that mm -hmm. whole process yeah now, that's crazy you asked me a question i would have asked someone that was sitting in your shoes like literally a year ago because yeah. when i shot when he asked me to move over i never shot vlogs before mm. the, the first vlog i shot for him in noosa was the first ever vlog i shot for anyone yeah, okay. normally i was doing commercial stuff shooting events and models and stuff like they weren't vlogs they were just one minute yeah. highlight reels Absolutely. they normally didn't have anyone talking in them yeah. like the closest i got was that one in chile before i shot moved to steve and that was just asking Ben questions and it was awkward for both of us. He'd yeah. never been on a vlog and I never interviewed someone properly like that, mm -hmm. especially when they actually, when Under Armour wanted us to get emotions out. 
and asking him how he feels when he's running and he's not even wearing ear pods and he's been running 80 Ks. Like yeah. I was, yeah, I didn't know what I was doing at all. Like mm. I kind of just dived in the deep end and try to learn along the way. And for me, I think from the technical aspect is what we do now compared to what we were doing when we were doing two every day was just turning it on and just because Steve is happy to talk and explain what he's doing. Yeah. It was easy for him because he's been doing it for 10 years. Yeah. So I just recorded everything and okay. that becomes a problem, right? Yeah, and you've got so much storage and you've just got so much footage. Like just from what we've done a little bit, yeah, man, I'm like, I don't know where the hell you're keeping this stuff, let alone the amount of stuff you'd be shooting. Yeah. I mean, you would have been equipped with, with storage space and hard drives yeah. wouldn't have been an issue, but it's like still, it's, it's like filter. if you're not managed properly, no, like no, that no. would you, be you got to have your shit sorted because shit can go ham. And when you say to people, say in the last video that we publish every Monday and Thursday, they're going to expect them to see it and people question you when you don't put one up like what are you guys doing playing with your thumbs like what um so the biggest thing that we learned which was literally this year from noticing uploading too many not getting high raising views to just having average just plain views all the way through to now making it more thought out and planned so having an action plan would be my best advice to you is actually thinking what you want to talk about. So anything you want to talk about, write it down, put it in a circle and try and figure out what connects to it so that it all can relate. So then every time that something that you can capture that can help emphasize that point, capture that. Mm. Anything else these days, get rid of because attention span on the internet these days is so short that if you don't give them what you're trying to get across in the message, people are going to lose track on what you're really trying to say. And I see it a lot in like a lot of people that are huge on YouTube these days that are either gamers or um, David Doback or just people that's videos are so short and just cut from one point to the other that they cut out all the bullshit. And people don't care about your bullshit these days because you're competing with someone on a platform that might have 23 million subscribers and you're trying to compete with them and give them your bullshit when they can cop someone else's. Mm. And now this person that they do have been following for 10 years is not giving any bullshit. They're going to say, why do I want to hear your bullshit? Yeah, sure. If that makes any sense at yeah, all. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah, the bullshit game, really. Yeah. It's, it's it awesome. Right. Bad word to use, but um, it's pretty much like get to the point these days. Makes sense. Uh, makes why sense. TikTok and stories on Instagram are killing it because mm. you have a limit of where you give yourself a restriction of what you want to show people yeah. and get it across if you don't get it across well people aren't going to receive it yeah. it's very engaging content yeah. tiktok's very engaging content are you guys exploring that uh steve wants to now because morgan's actually does really well on tiktoks okay. and because she's a hands balancer and does a lot of crazy things that most people can't yeah, even nice. think about doing uh amazing, yeah Gonna watch some of her I, th- I, th- I think I've seen I've seen some of the content that you've posted, which athlete. looks <laughs> yeah. yeah. She is an athlete. That's epic, Shout man. Out Morgan. My my other question to you was, um, uh, what have you learned personally through the, this experience? It's been a lot jammed into a short um, amount of time. I think mostly just about myself. Um, yeah. When you put yourself in a situation where you're by yourself, you'll learn a lot about yourself yeah. um, and what's going to be valuable to you. After shooting, like in the content world of like shooting Sydney events and meeting all these people that I followed on Instagram and all these models and all these people that had high high reputations and getting to meet a lot of people that like work in Hollywood and LA and stuff. It's really doesn't come down to what people do Mm -hmm. like work wise and stuff to me anymore. It's more how that person is and how they react to everything they do. So like I believe that all your actions in life reflect who you are. So whether they will say hi to me if they do know me. It's almost like when you walk around the shopping center and you might have been slightly friends with a person that you went to school with. Now, if they decide to put their head down or you decide to put your head down, that's a reflection of what kind of person you are. Mm. Um, If you are game enough to say hi or even say hi to that person, you do know, like you both know each other. We all know the situation. It's like... It's like, who's going to be the bigger person and start the conversation? Or are you going to be the bigger person and make it awkward? That's the question you have to ask yourself. Sure. But for yeah. me now, it's more like I'm more game to do it. If they don't, if they wanted to make it awkward or it's that person that doesn't want to interact with me, fair enough, that's them. That's not me. Um, that's the biggest thing that I've learned. And being someone around someone like Steve and living in that situation with him full time, it's really the five people you live closest to that 
really make a mark on you. And someone like him that puts time and effort into speaking to people, like there's gym shock events that people line up for four hours to shake his hand. Yeah. And most people in the gym shock um, events normally get the photo, get out of the line. That's the situation that so many people have to get through within the yeah. day. He will spend five, 10 minutes to people asking them questions, yeah. not them asking him. It's and funny. that puts a different point on what a person is. A hundred, it's funny you say that. I still remember uh, Steve came. It would have been when you guys maybe first started working together. Mm-hmm. Came over, trained at Impact. Mm-hmm. Shout out to Impact. Great gym. Um, but yeah, that's, I remember. I remember the one, like the thing I took away from him, man, like he was training with Nath and like he, he came out of his leg session like to chat and was mm-hmm. talking to me and, and actually like, you could tell that he cared and wanted to be a part of the conversation where when you've got that much attention on you, man, like it's, it's very easy to fall into the trap of like in and out. Yeah. Like let's get through the masses, get through the mass, especially at like some of those gym shark pop-ups, oh. man, there's so many people. Yeah. And it, because it's free, it's like anyone can come. So yeah. anyone can start a conversation and speak to you for half an hour about their life. Yeah. And the thing is as well, like after meeting all these people, there's so many people that, not let me down but you have expectations for people that you see on social media these mm-hmm. days and you think what they are they might be different in person and it it kind of doesn't live up to what you think or create it to be and that's almost your own fault but mm-hmm. in believing what they're saying or what they're doing and whatnot or sure. building up the hype for what this person is but mm-hmm. the same sense he's just when you meet him he's obviously just like a normal guy and yeah. He doesn't treat anyone differently. It doesn't matter where you're from, what you do, blah, blah, blah. And just living around that guy was just, it gave me the same kind of radiance and just flowed onto me. And it was something yeah. that I kind of like took on and learned from him hugely because at the end of the day, that is one of the big keys that I have learned this year was mainly from him. Yeah. Yeah. That's epic, man. That that whole, how how it's perceived and and I can understand why he would be that way because you've got people lining up for four hours Mm. and it's like and you've got people who have probably been waiting for so long to meet you and man I did his I did his I can't remember what it was it was like college it was his college big man on campus big man on campus Well, I did that when I first started getting into training. And so I think it sounds like he can really recognize that mm. and, and he knows how much effort people are putting in for him. Yeah. So he just wants to give that even if it's five minutes or two minutes. Like I've seen people who I've seen both ends of the spectrum and, and it really helps you um, appreciate people more mm-hmm. um, who have got this big thing, but they haven't, they haven't let, let their ego – um, yeah. get, get in front and go and just flick people off because if it wasn't for them, if it's not for the people lining up, Gymshark aren't anything. Steve's, yeah. well, not Steve's not anything, but that's those people, those raving fans are a big part of why these people are the way that yeah. they are. Yeah. And um, full credit to him. I'm excited to meet him one day. Just a normal dude, just super, super jacked. Mm. Yeah, super jacked. Well, he's, he stayed very grounded and I think that's one of the key aspects to it is not obviously with all those people wanting to meet you and be like you and inspired by you and all this stuff. It can be so easy to have a big head and yeah. um, big ego and stuff like that. But he does very well to <clears throat> visit his grandparents and every Sunday we go to their place and things like that and play just simple board games or cards and nice. visit his family when they're in town and hangs out with family friends that are just local. And living in a place like St. George, it's just in the middle of the desert. It's a small town. It kind of makes you grounded and no, no one cares who you are there and yeah. th- no one knows who I am so it doesn't matter like that's cool. and that's one of the things I learned by living in a complete different place on the other side of the world is it doesn't really matter what you do online or for work in general you don't have to do things online but yeah. at the end of the day a person comes down to a person so when you meet someone I'm this might be the first time I met you I don't know what you do mm. how am, how are you going to treat me how am I going to treat you sure. that's the biggest thing I learned from being a shy person that wouldn't say anything to anyone kind of does hurt you in a way without you realizing can hurt you more often than not. Yeah. And that could be from joining in a conversation where in a content world, using your voice to get along and make um, work. I've got so much work out of word of mouth of just having conversations with people being like, oh, my mom does this or yeah. my mate runs this business. He could use with a video that often or not that can make you a lot of money at the end of the day yeah. and it's it's funny man because knowing that one thing mm-hmm. um can 
create someone's career. Like, like I think, I think if that was the one thing that I um, would say to young people wanting to get into it, it's like if you can network mm -hmm. and if you can just be your authentic self and just be nice to people. Yeah. Like I'm the exact same man. It's like you never know who is that person sitting over there, exactly. who their connections are, and and, yeah. and also also. Um, being authentic enough to understand that n not want stuff from other people exactly. but but through your authenticity comes those opportunities mm -hmm. so they come at the right time yeah. um, which is awesome what's been your what's been one of the best experiences for you so far um, that's tough to grab one but I think just being out of like just wake up and um, know that that I'm in a stable career like I'm in a stable point in my career now that I can just enjoy what I do every day. It's yeah. I, I do remember waking up and just hating to get up at 4.30 and drive to Sydney for two hours before I even get paid and be half asleep. And yes, like there is days where I don't want to wake up still to this day and get up early and do mm -hmm. stuff. But when I start, I'm so grateful for what I do. And just being able to have the opportunity to see so many beautiful places in the world mm -hmm. and capture that and get paid to do that and just meet so many cool and unique people. There's so many people that even on the set of The Biggest Loser that we had to spend hours with someone that just looks after you while you're waiting to go on set and stuff like that, that you become great friends with. Yeah. And it's someone that I met on the other side of the world through shooting that I'm now best mates with that we are starting a business together on the other side of the world. He lives full time in London. He's a freelancer and he's just like a well respected photographer. And we both met each other without knowing that he was a creator and I was a creator or how good he was or how good I am. Because these days on Instagram and stuff, most people will judge you off how many followers you have, what yeah, posts yeah. you post <laughs> yeah. and things like that. So to just meet some people that really was the best experience for me is just to meet those people that are unique and mm. are relatable and are just good people in general. So, but If you yeah, could sort of look back at maybe when you were in year 12 or that 16 to 18 year old self, mm -hmm. um, taking on everything that you've, that you've learned so far, any advice that you would give yourself at that age? Yeah, um, it'd probably be to um, just have faith. Um, especially if you do have a situation there's an excuse for everything and communicating in life is like key as i explained through this podcast and mm. stuff whether it is visually or um through writing or just talking with people is so huge and how you can get forward in life and um just having enough confidence in yourself and trying to build that so trying to figure out who i was um and trying to nail down that was the biggest key for me so realizing even simple points that I'm not an early riser because I used to listen to people like Gary Vee yeah. and try and be motivated to get up at 5 a.m. But knowing that I'm a night owl and that I wouldn't be actually asleep until 2.33, even if I went to bed at 11. Yeah, that, and then getting up some days at 4.30 to drive to Sydney did not help me one bit at all. <laughs> um, so oh, there is a lot of awesome advice out there um, for everything, but you need to understand what works for you. So trying everything mm. can be a way to f figure out. But once you find it, go with it and just take on that leap of faith because it's going to be worth it no matter what you do because if it's for what you want to do and for fun and what you love, you're going to get so much more out of it than a pay packet at the end of the day. Mm. There's so many times even to date that I still do where I'll do a project or just shoot something for free just because I want to do it. Mm. It doesn't. I don't care that I want to do it so bad that I don't care that someone has to pay me or I'll figure out a way that a company can collaborate with me or work with me so I can get paid to do that yeah. so that I can fund that project so I can make it even bigger than what I imagined, mm. if that makes any sense. But yeah, taking that leap of faith on what I really want to do mm. is what I can recommend to people. Like it, it, it is scary. It's, mm. it's never going to be easy. Like if it was easy, everyone would be living their dream jobs. Yeah. It's as simple as that. Like you wouldn't have people being garbage men because no one is a five-year-old kid and wants to grow up and be the garbage man. Maybe there is, but I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. But yeah, it's as simple as that. Like just trying to figure out who you are and what you want to do and then putting full, yeah, just having the faith is like, what's the worst? For me in my situation, what was the worst that could come out? I have to go back to landscaping. I might have to work for a different person. I. I'm fully qualified at that point 
yes, that's a parachute. So then I can work for $27 an hour. That's not that bad. Yeah. And at least I figured out the question that I was always asking. If, you, if you're not going to ask the question, you won't know the answer. Mm. And it's as simple as that. So mm. I love that, man. I think awesome. before we go, you are the content man. The boys that are listening, um, I know that they'll love your content as well. So where can we find you on socials? Um, Instagram, Alec Baker Films. Um, probably best to find me on Steve Cook's YouTube because my one's not active. <laughs> yeah. Don't have time for that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't really have much social media presence um, besides that, mainly just because obviously I'm building other people's. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's quite a lot of people like before I worked with Steve, I was managing influencers in Sydney. Mm. Um, their social media and creating what I do for Steve now besides mm. the YouTube stuff Instagram wise and that's what I was doing for them but yeah um, Alec Baker Films on Instagram or Steve Cook if you want to see me in a vlog here and there that's epic man I love it thank you so much for coming on there's so much value there and um, looking forward to watching you continue likewise, likewise. awesome bro Legend, thank man. you so Thanks, much I appreciate your time no Cheers. worries